Dottie Brar, Vice Chair of the Communist Party of Great Britain, spokesperson for the World Anti-Imperialist Platform, author of The Drive to War Against Russia and China. Jati Brar, salam and welcome to Al Mayadeen. This is the proximate aspect. I'm Zainab Al Safar. A pleasure to have you, Jati. Hello, Malaikum. It's lovely to be with you. Thank you. Most welcome, ma'am. Well, uh, the end of the Cold War in 1989 and the subsequent breakup of the Soviet Union changed the political landscape and the global situation fundamentally, leaving the United States as the only the sole superpower. Today, Jotty, as the author of the drive to war against Russia and China, why are the US and the British ruling classes so set on a war with both Russia and China? It's a very good question, isn't it? I mean, from, from a normal human perspective, it seems a, a crazy activity. But you have to understand that uh, the global capitalist cri uh, system is in a huge crisis. And because the global capitalist system is, a, is now a global one, it's not confined within any particular country, it spans the entire world, its contradictions have also become global. And the, 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 the biggest contradiction is the contradiction between uh, the, all the goods that are produced, the wealth that's produced, and the wages that the workers are paid, and the fact that workers can't pay for the goods they've produced. And what this leads to is a huge overproduction crisis, is, there's no way to make money by selling things to people who can't afford to buy them. So this leads to speculation. It leads to the, the fundamental contradiction at the heart of our system. But like I said, the, the, the system is now global. Its inequalities are now global. Its crises are now global. And what we have is a few imperialist countries who are home to the vast majority of the world's wealth. The, the imperialist financiers uh, control the governments of those countries and the armies of those countries. And they loot the world and attract the world's wealth towards them. They are having a massive crisis and they see anything that gets in the way of their ability to make a profit as a real big problem. And Russia and China, both in their different ways, are standing in the way of the profit taking of imperialism, just as Iran is, just as any country like Venezuela, the DPRK, any country which stands up and says, our resources and our people, we're going to run them as we see fit and not according to what makes the most profit for finance capital. That's a problem for finance capital. Right now, with the global economic system absolutely melting down, the imperialists are desperate to find a way to restart demand in their system. And the way that they want to do that is to break apart Russia and China, to remove the independent governments those countries have, and to get hold of their resources and just loot them for all they're worth. And the governments of Russia, the government of China, stand in the way of them being able to do that. And they're driving with such a will right now because their system is really imploding. You can see the inflation crisis they've fueled mm -hmm. is running away from them. And in fact, more than instead of getting a hold on it, they're, they're fueling it more with ever more money so printing, money printing that's going out of control. Yes, and we, we can all say that the strongest countries resisting US expansionism have become China and Russia. How did they stand uh, as obstacles to expansionist imperialist policies? Uh, on the other hand, well, uh, Jotty, some observers might argue that China is turning to be a new imperialist state. What's your sense? So, the idea that Russia or China are imperialist countries is really an idea that's been spread by the imperialists themselves. And unfortunately, they've had a great deal of success in causing confusion in the world because, of course, the vast masses of the people of the world hate imperialism and they know it's their enemy. So if you can tell them that a country who is actually defending their interests is their enemy, you can neutralize them in the coming conflict. And it's a, it's a very important ideological weapon of the imperialists to brand Russia and China as imperialist and to spread that disinformation amongst the working class, amongst the communists, the socialists, the anti-imperialists, to cause confusion and to neutralize the most important, what should be the leading section of the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, what would a real movement against imperialist war 
uh, look like, Jotty? Might you elaborate about the anti-war movement in Britain, uh, for example, today? And what can the working class do to prevent such a cataclysm? Sure. You know, the, the, the anti-war movement in Britain today is in a real state. And the reason is because it's controlled by what we call a controlled opposition. People who claim to be socialist or anti-imperialist or anti-war, uh, to want peace. But in reality, they're very much tied to the Labour Party in Britain, which is the alternative ruling party of British imperialism and which is a warmongering party. And it spreads the idea amongst working people that, you know, uh, electing a Labour government is going to solve the war problem. The reality is there is a way for working people in Britain to stop wars, to stop British ruling class involvement in wars, and that is to refuse collectively to participate in those wars. It means we have to have our trade unions and social organisations have to organise us in numbers to refuse to participate with every aspect of the war, including, very importantly, not just making the, the weapons or firing the weapons or, but, or moving all of the logistical materials, but it also means refusing to cooperate with putting out the war propaganda, which is such a big and important part of our ruling class's way of waging war. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, we are witnessing, I'll come to talk about and ask you about the Labour Party more uh, further during the interview, but allow me to ask you here, uh, today we are witnessing a new tidal crisis of imperialism embodied by a desperation of the uh, billionaire rulers of the capitalist world to save their failing system. Why are the imperialists so desperate, so adamant to bring Russia and China down. Are we witnessing the worst ever economic crisis of capitalism? Absolutely, yes. It is the worst ever economic crisis of capitalism. In fact, this crisis has been steadily worsening since the 1970s. And the whole system was given a temporary reprieve when the Soviet Union collapsed because the imperialists got to territory of the Soviet Union for quite a few years. But with a nationalist government coming to power in Russia under the leadership of Vladimir Putin, that situation was reversed. And Russia started to be able to take back control of its territory and say to the imperialists, no, we'll trade with you. We'll have relations with you, but you can't just loot us. We're not going to run our country in your interests, right? Mm -hmm. And since then, the, the, the capitalist system has again been heading towards this really deep crisis. We saw in 2008, there was a huge global financial crisis and the capitalists saved themselves by printing money. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, what's been happening is that money has been causing inflation all over the world. It means the people of the world have been stolen from, their wages, their pensions, their savings are worth less Asset prices and the wealth of the rich have gone up. So there's been a massive transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich. That's how they escaped from the last crisis. But all they really did was make the crisis deeper. And now what we're seeing is they're quietly bailing out bank after bank mm -hmm. around the world. The same crisis is here, only worse. Mm -hmm. That's very true, Jotty. Imperialism uh, strives for domination. It strives for control over resources and control over markets and control over opportunities for profit uh, taking. This is much recognized also in foreign uh, policy. What about the domestic dynamics of the empire policy inside the UK today, Jotty? Well, because imperialism is in a crisis, what we're seeing now is the it started slowly and now it's really accelerating the unpicking of the the settlement that was made for workers after World War II in the Western countries, which was to buy social peace at home and to prevent a socialist revolution. The imperialists bought themselves time by providing a social safety net and a decent standard of living to all the workers in their home countries. Well, what's happening now is we're, we're reverting very quickly now to a situation like we had between the wars, where a small section of the, of the working class had a relatively decent uh, conditions of life, but the vast majority are finding that their life is getting worse and worse. All of the social provisions are being privatized, unpicked, um, wages are, are declining really badly. Exactly. Conditions of life 
I mean, very bad for the mm -hmm. vast majority of workers in the West. Mm -hmm. Now, how is the American imperialism, uh, Jolti, attempting to subordinate people in the global South to maximize the theft of their resources, labor and wealth? I mean, they use everything possibly at their power, don't they? So they they have a huge financial power which obviously enables them to, to control a lot of things, to buy off movements, to buy off leaders around the world. But they back that up with their armed power, with this constant threat that we can use our sanctions and our military machine against you. These are the way that they keep uh, uh, countries in line. So they try to buy off their leaders and just make them puppets. If that's not possible, they have economic weapons like sanctions that they use against countries. And if that doesn't work, the, uh, the weapon of last resort is we've got an army and our army has better weapons and stronger weapons than yours and we'll be able to defeat you. So with these layers of, uh, of attack and, and of, of weaponry, they're able to really um, keep a lot of countries in the world in line. Yet, uh, ho however, with the growth of the number of countries, uh, countries that are densely populated, with big economies, diversified resources and culture, uh, powerful industrial and agricultural spheres, uh, advanced scientific capabilities, plus some with uh, actually nuclear military capabilities. Today, such countries are joining more the BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Has the era of multipolarity uh, just begun? You put your finger on something so important there, Zainab, which is that really the era of imperialism showed that it was coming to an end during the First World War. And the first sign of that was the Russian Revolution, the October Revolution, which set in motion the whole train of socialist liberation movements and national liberation movements. And that once that was out of the bag, you know, even with the reverses of 1991, that genie can't go back into the bottle now. That is a situation that, you know, the vast majority of the peoples uh, of the world live in countries which are not imperialist countries. Um, they are not prepared to carry on forever being subordinated and having their lives controlled by these uh, super rich financiers in the West. What we're finding is the key to their success and to their escaping is technology. You know, like I said, the imperialists, for so long, they were able to dominate the world because as well as their financial power, they had this military power where the, they had such advanced weapons compared to other countries that nobody could stand up to them. Now, the thing that is really upsetting the USA right now is we, not only Russia as a result of the Soviet Union's development, but China and the DPRK have developed the kind of weapons which the USA and Britain have, in which case, where is their ability to dominate and threaten and blackmail uh, being left? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, allow me to uh, take you back to the UK, where you are talking to us from, in getting back to the domestic dynamics of the UK, uh, the UK parties, actually. Uh, Scottish First Minister Humza Youssef uh, tweeted recently, this week, uh, and I'm quoting him, this week I accused Labour of being a pale, imitation of the Tories, I was wrong. They are a replica. Uh, Jotty, has Labour become a replica of the Conservatives in your perspective? Absolutely. I mean, every single party on the, on the recognised political spectrum in Britain is a bourgeois political party. That means fundamentally, because our country is an imperialist country, they're all imperialist parties. They're all different ways of presenting the same fundamental policy. And whether it's the Scottish Nationalists, which are also one of them, uh, whether it's the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Democrats, or even the Trotskyite parties, you know, or the far right parties, actually all of them have the same programme, which is save British imperialism. All they do is wrap it up in different branding. Mm -hmm. But why are the people signing up more into these uh, parties? Have the people become so much, you know, polarised either way? I think we've had such a long time of misinformation. You know, the, the media, uh, the way it presents politics, as if there is nothing outside of the bourgeois spectrum mm -hmm. uh, that could possibly be considered. Uh, you know, parties like mine, for example, are never invited mm -hmm. um, and never covered. We're never even mentioned. You know, I'm pretty sure that there's an unofficial ruling that says if you mention my party on any paper, you're going to get sacked. You know, so... Um, 
because the alternatives don't even get talked about, it's presented, you know, that uh, your, your, your options are this or this or nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and people don't really uh, have the opportunity to understand what a different perspective looks like because it's never shown to them. Sure. Well, uh, some observers note that 2023 is a make or break year for Labour Party. Why are we to witness an ebb of the Labour Party? You know, the Labour Party and the Tory Party, they both ebb and flow according to, you know, how people are feeling, how well the media manages to control people's anger and, and redirect it and all, all kinds of things. You know, uh, the reality is with the system in such decay and decline, really interesting, uh, useful, intelligent people can't really be attracted into the into the ranks of these parties, despite the fact that they offer you know, fairly decent careers to the politicians who engage in them. And so they're all uninspiring. And at a time of crisis, when our rulers uh, are really struggling to find a way to uh, reconcile us to their rule and to their system, none of the parties is really particularly attractive or interesting to people. The vast majority of people in Britain have tuned out from everything any of them are saying. And those of them who are left uh, you know, tend to be the better off who are still hoping there's some way to make the system work nicely. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when it comes to supporting Ukrainian forces, uh, is the United Kingdom trying to cajole other nations into following its uh, suit, its lead? And how much are the Brits paying a heavy price for that? I mean, around the world, you know, the British have shown themselves uh, very much committed and involved in this war in Ukraine. It's very clear that they play a huge intelligence role, they play a huge training role, a huge amount of British finance is going into this operation. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely cheerleading for the most aggressive stance, the most hawkish activity, you know, sending depleted uranium rounds to Ukraine, for example. Um, they're always the ones who are wanting to ratchet up tensions instead of bring them back down. So it's very clear that British finance capital is very involved in this war, has really hitched its, its future to the bandwagon of, of US imperialism and says, you know, if we don't succeed in this war, we're, we're heading for the buffers. So they, they, they're really all in. And I think that they are becoming exposed. Mm -hmm. um, what about the, the repercussions of getting that much uh, in depth uh, in bed with the Ukrainian forces, so to say. Uh, uh, what are the repercussions of that on the British people? You know, at this moment in time, it's a very small section of the British working class which is really aware of Britain's role because it's almost entirely unmentioned mm -hmm. in the British uh, news media. Um, but the section which is aware, I think, is a growing section. And once those people become aware of what's happening, um, you know, the blinkers are off their eyes forever. And I think the, the section of the British population that's becoming cynical mm -hmm. and the section that's becoming better informed about what's going on is, is growing every day. Right. Now, experts believe that it is a bold strategic fact that uh, Brexit makes the UK less useful to Washington. Without leverage in Brussels, Britain is not in a position to broker deals uh, with the US. But when it comes to defense and security cooperation, it is one of the sturdiest alliances in the world. What makes Jotty uh, Downing Street aides unhealthily obsessed with US politics? I mean, essentially, you have to look at the history of British imperialism. You know, remember that up until the World War I, Britain was the number one power in the world. Mm -hmm. But as a result of World War I and its own crisis and how much of its energy was used up in that war, um, the USA, which hadn't been really directly uh, involved in that war and certainly, you know, was, was profiting very much from the war, came out stronger. And the position between the two world wars, again, you know, Britain was in decline. And by the end of the Second World War, it was very clear that the British Empire was on its knees and British imperialism would no longer could... Uh, think of itself, didn't have the power any longer to really, uh, you know, conquer the world on its own. And so after the Suez crisis, really, the British realised if they were to survive as an imperialist power, they needed to hitch themselves to the US. They needed to ally as a junior, junior partner and really 
put their expertise together in order that the finance capitalists of Britain, who are still, of course, there and enormously wealthy and powerful, could have the military might to back up their financial might. And so that's be that's become the deal, right? You know, they hitch their interests, they subordinate their interests to the USA to a certain extent, they work as a junior partner, they, they fulfill certain roles for US imperialism, it gives the US a kind of plausible deniability for certain aspects of its policy, um, and the British are very experienced yes. imperialists. Right, but, but despite that, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has said in its latest set of forecasts that Britain will have the highest inflation of any major developed economy this year, but should narrowly avoid a recession. Your take, please, Jotty. I mean, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. We've been in recession for years. It's just that they have very good ways of fiddling the figures, just like you know, they say your, your inflation is this much. But if you go to the shops as, as an ordinary person, you know what real inflation is. You know that on some everyday household items, and particularly the ones that the poorest people use, inflation is more like 40 percent than 10 percent. You know, so, um, yeah, it, the inflation is rampant and uh, we are. We have been in recession for quite some time. Right. Uh, we have to leave it uh, here. Jotty Brar, a leader of the Communist Party of Great Britain. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us from Bristol. Always a pleasure to have you, Jotty. Thank you so much for having me, Zainab. Most welcome, ma'am. <laughs>